Thank you. This is, um, well, I'm going to take this with me and, and walk out right here and put up portraits. Uh, Mary Dale, thank you so much for that. Um, now, you know, when you came to the state and like, hold it a little bit farther away, came to the state and, and stay here, um, I mean, I'm sure there was an exaggeration, partly because of the main times and my drawings there. There was a vast exodus of people who couldn't stand those drawings. You know? <laughs> it worked both ways. Um, I mean, I still hear from those people. Um, anyway, what a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for inviting me. Um, you know, I, I just want to give you a little background. I mean, some of you, I know a number of people here, but not all that many. And um, my first 11, 12 years in, in Maine were spent in Gouldsboro doing the back of the land thing. I was not an artist, but I was trying to teach myself to be an artist. And I raised my kids in the woods without electricity, with a pump in the kitchen sink and an outhouse. And I would um, get books in the library and copy drawings by uh, Leonardo and Durr and and they got at night by kerosene light. And I spent um, 12 or 13 years only drawing and then learning printmaking. And it was only after that that I began to experiment with color when I was being asked to, to illustrate more and more. And it came as a kind of revelation to me. Um, first, I was coloring on my own etchings, um, sort of like coloring book. And uh, but then gradually realized that I could expand out of that to uh, mix my own colors and play around a little bit more. I gradually developed a voice as a surrealist. And I had gotten, you know, after a lot of years, to a place where I could support myself and the family by you know, making paintings, illustrating books, and indulging in what I thought was really my obligation as an artist was to explore mystery and ambiguity. Uh, you know, that we all, you know, it, it, it's at the basis of all of our identities and actions. And then after 9-11, I gave all that up. But it wasn't 9-11 that caused that. It was what came right afterwards with the United States using, our government using that event to um, promote the war against Iraq. Um, it was, you know, bluntly put, that was a war crime. And you know, it's not so bad that, you know, a government, our government was lying. Everybody's government lies, you know, from time to time or maybe all the time. But, um, you know, what was terrible was that um, the, the, the one safeguard we have against that, a, our press, was cheery without examining what was really being said or purposely not examining what was really being said because, you know, for the most part, we don't really have a free press, that's why I painted Amy Goodman. You know, we have a corporate press and that's a very, very different thing. And I was in a condition of rage, what Terry Tempest Williams calls sacred rage. I was so full of anger and grief that I was becoming a danger to myself and my ranting was becoming a danger to everyone around me. I was really upset. And I kept thinking, I've got to do something you know, positive with his anger. You know, an awful lot of good stuff comes from, from anger. And I thought, I've got to turn this. Rather than just complain one more day about Dick Cheney, I really have to find some way to channel this to do something good. And it took me a long time to figure out what that might be. Well, a long time being several months. And then it became really obvious in a way that the answer was to surround myself with Americans who made me feel really good about the country rather than obsessed about the ones who didn't. And I painted, what I'm going to do is, is hold them up, just some of these, and tell a few stories about them or comment on them. What I brought here, were, these are all artists. I painted, my goal was to paint 50 paintings. I never thought I'd do it. I, was, I didn't, had never painted a realistic portrait in my life. I was, um, you know, as I said, a surrealist. And I was much more comfortable distorting than being accurate. But with this, for the purpose of what I was doing, I knew I had to honor the people I was painting and try to be as accurate uh, about them as I possibly could be. And um, the 
question was where to start. And I thought about that a little bit and then looked up at my studio wall and there was a quote that I put up there years ago from Walt Whitman about how to live in the world. And I thought, that's it. I'm gonna paint off a wall. I'm gonna paint him, I'm gonna scratch his words into it and I'm gonna feel better. Because this, this portrait, this project really began as an art therapy project for me. You know, to, to make myself, to heal myself, to feel less alienated from my own country, our country. And so I painted Walt. And this is, um, and when I did this, I didn't actually think I was going to paint a series of paintings. I thought that I would paint one painting, and then I would have to go back to doing, you know, my other work. I don't sell these paintings, and I knew from the very beginning that I wouldn't sell the paintings. That I would, but I also thought it would be one painting, uh, and it was just a, a timeout thing. Um, and so I did this, and this quote that I'm not, not going to read the whole quote, but uh, just say the, the first line of it, which will explain and then explain why he was the first painting. So in the uh, preface to the second edition of Leaves of Grass, in the prose edition, this is that preface, he says, This is what you shall do love the earth, the sun, and the animals. That, you know, has to be the first commandment of all of our lives. I mean, nothing else really uh, makes sense unless we honor that. I mean, you can't have a democracy unless you love the earth, the sun, and the animals, which means you're supporting the public trust and the environment for the next generation and generations to follow. That has to be the first precept of how we live. We didn't do that. We haven't done that. And as we all know, we're paying the price for that now. As we scurry around trying to figure out, you know, in the next 10 years, you know, how to save ourselves from ourselves. But just at that, at that moment, I wasn't thinking about, you know, climate change. I was only thinking about how we treated the environment in this country and how I saw that and the simplicity of what he was saying there. I painted this portrait and I put it up in the entryway to our house. My partner, Gail, is sitting back over there. And, um, you know, I, for a couple of weeks, I, you know, I had gone to the library. I'd gotten all these books about Walt Whitman. I was reading his biographies. I was, you know, reading his poetry. I was talking about him all the time. And then I made the painting and put it up. And two people came in the house shortly after that where the painting was. And they stood in front of it and burst into tears. And I was saying, oh, my God, I thought it was a better painter than that. You know, it was, <laughs> But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that it was a great painting or a bad painting. It was simply that they saw in him and what he was saying, they felt that, that nostalgia for the country we had wanted to be and haven't been. And that there were these words. And here was this incredible man looking at us and still asking that of us, you know, to reconsider how we're living. I was very moved by that reaction. And I thought about painting some more, and I, but I didn't think I was really going to do it. And then I started a couple days later, start ranting again. And uh, Gail said to me, why don't you paint a few more paintings? You were such a nice guy <laughs> when you were looking at, you know, you were painting Walt Whitman. And I said, you're right. I'm going to paint 50 portraits. I'm going to call them Americans to tell the truth. And then we're going to give them all away. Well, I know this is a conference about the economic, uh, economics of art. <laughs> this is not your model, right? <laughs> and uh, the second thought was, well, as soon as I said that, I felt like I'd levitated. I felt entirely free, maybe freer than I ever had in my life, that I was going to make a lot of artwork and then give it away. And then, of course, a little reality check. I know, oh, how are we going to live? And I said, you know, I don't know. I don't know how we're going to live, you know, but I know I've got to do this. And I, it's really important that I give it away. I mean, one of the next paintings was Frederick Douglass. Imagine if I painted Frederick Douglass and then sold Frederick Douglass. Something wrong with that model, you know? <laughs> or Sojourner Truth, or Harriet Tubman, you know, whom I, whom I painted. Um, but it was everybody. I mean, all the people I painted have given an incredible amount. Most of them never got paid for anything they did. Uh, and we are 
you know, to the extent that we have the ideals and the freedoms and the liberties and the, um, you know, that we do in this country, it's due to them mostly, you know? So, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly tell you some artist stories. Uh, by the way, in here, in the back is Arthur Miller, you know, the great playwright. You all know him. And uh, the quote that's on his painting is, he says, I think the job of the artist is to remind people of what they have chosen to forget. Now, you can take that all kinds of ways, and I take it all kinds of ways. But I have always felt that that was our job in a lot of ways. You know, sometimes people forget the simplest thing about beauty. You know, they forget um, what it means to have compassion. You know, they forget justice. They forget all kinds of things, you know. Uh, and I think, we I mean, just look at our society today. Who, who, you know, who is free enough to, to remind us um, that those are the things we need to live by if, it's, if life is going to be worth living at all? Um, so let me tell you. There's probably nobody in this room who doesn't know who Woody Guthrie is, but I spend a lot of time in schools all over this country. This project has now became uh, something way beyond an art therapy project, and it takes me all over the country to schools, colleges, libraries, uh, churches, everywhere to talk about the paintings and the people. And it's extraordinary how my life has now changed. I mean, actually, I can survive by getting paid to talk rather than selling paintings. Woody Guthrie, if you go into literally any fifth grade classroom in this country, and you say, who's Woody Guthrie? A lot of blank stares. And then you say, oh, wait a minute. Can you sing This Land Is Your Land? And everybody can sing it. They can sing the first two or three verses. And they'll sing them. Like, we, we, everybody sings it. We get them singing it, you know? And then you say, well, wait a minute. Where's the rest of the song? And our schools don't teach the rest of the song. Woody Guthrie wrote this song in 1940 when he was hitchhiking from um, Oklahoma to New York City. And he was being picked up all the time. He, he says in, in his autobiography, he was being picked up. And people always had the radio on. And there was somebody singing America the Beautiful. He said, when I got to New York, I was so sick of that song <laughs> that I had to write my own you know, anthem. But this is a guy who just also you know, been in all over the the West, the Midwest, California, Oklahoma, Texas, he'd experienced the worst of the Depression and the worst of the Dust Bowl. His people, his people were in refugee camps in California being treated like refugees are being treated around the world today. Americans treating Americans like that. He would go to these camps, you know, and these, pe these were all farmers, you know, people with enormous dignity and pride in work who were no longer able to support themselves and their families by working. And they were in these refugee camps, starving and being treated very badly by the people around there. There were no jobs. And he would go there. I mean, there were people, because of the way they were being treated, who had lost their self-respect. And he would go and listen to their stories and then sing their stories back to them. You know, he could write stories I and mean, songs in a matter of minutes sometimes. He would use art to see the authentic people and you know, give them something to respect to themselves because of the way he reformulated their own stories. You know, that's one of the great gifts that art is able to do, is to give dignity to people when they see themselves in it. It seems like they've been you know, moved to a higher plane because of what the art can do. So he wrote this song, you know, and, uh, but the song, the first verses are all set up. You know, he was, he was wanting you to get into this song about, man, this is a great country. It's so big, it's so beautiful, it's yours, it's mine, you know, this is, we love this place, right? Well, the last couple of verses are what he was trying to get you to. In the second to last verse, he says, one bright sunny morning in the shadow of the steeple by the relief office, I saw my people. As they stood there hungry, I stood there wondering if this land was made for you and me. That was the hinge of the whole song, that if. 
you know, he had lived through a period where, you know, of this incredible wealth disparity, not unlike the situation in this country today. And he was, you know, he saw the question, is it really both yours and mine, or is it just yours? And then the next verse, he comes to a sign, and the sign says private property, and walks around the other side, and it doesn't say anything. He said, that's the side of the sign that's yours and mine. You know, that's what that was about. That's the kind of person he was. In the Second World War, he was a, he, he enlisted, and he got to be a deckhand on troop ships. You know, and these ships would go back and forth across the Atlantic in these huge convoys carrying supplies, arms, medical supplies, tanks, trucks, the whole works, you know, and, and also in his ship, 3,000 men in the hold under, you know, basically below the water level. And out around them were all the battleships. At night, German U-boats would attack, you know, and send some, you know, send the torpedoes in there. And so the men in the bottom of those ships, you know, would be here all the exploding, the ship was tossing, and they knew that if a torpedo hit their ship because they were below the water level, they, they're gone, you know, it's over real quick. Woody Guthrie's up on deck. I mean, he'd have a chance if it if they got hit, he'd maybe get in a lifeboat. And he's thinking about the men, and he gets his guitar, and he goes down, and he spends the whole night singing with the men to keep the morale up. He got a reputation for doing this, and one night, he was on a ship, and they were under attack, and he went down to sing, and he heard other voices from behind a bulkhead. And he said, oh, that's funny. I wonder why those guys can't be in with the rest of us. And he went to the captain, and they said, Captain, there's, there are other voices down there. They're behind this big steel wall. Can you open it up and bring them in? And the captain says, I can't do that. It's against regulations. And Woody says, what do you mean? What's the regulation? And the captain says, well, those are the black soldiers. They're not allowed to be in there with the white soldiers. And Woody said, well, I guess I'm not going to sing anymore tonight. And he walked away. And the captain ran after him and grabbed him and said, well, maybe we could bend the regulations tonight. Well, that was the first time our soldiers were integrated in this great war for democracy. You know, not because our fine politicians realized it looked bad you know, be fighting this war and segregate our own soldiers, but because a guy with leverage at that moment and was able to do the right thing. Amazing. Let's see, who should I tell you about here? I don't know if I tell you about this one. So I think I've painted maybe, I mean, 80 or 90 uh, historical figures. I'm mostly painting all living people now, and which is, I mean, when you choose to paint Martin Luther King, not too many people criticize you, um, or Rosa Parks, or Harriet Tubman, everybody says that's great. When you choose to paint living activists, it's sometimes a little bit of a different story, you know, and, and it's also riskier for me because I don't know how things are going to all play out, but that's what I do. I, I take these chances on painting people. But there's, um, about the artists, I don't think there's, um, in a lot of ways, there's not much doubt about what they do and why they do it and, and the effect they have. And, and each one of these people I chose to bring here, they use art in a different way. This woman, Lily Ye, was from Taiwan. She came to this country to, to Philadelphia to study art as a, College student, hoped to stay here, uh, start her career as a, as a gallery artist, and also teach and support herself uh, by both selling art and teaching. And then, uh, about well, almost 30 years ago now, she was asked to come into a community in North Philadelphia, a ghetto, and build a little park where a building had fallen down in this uh, black community that was, you know, the, the poster child for despair. You know, no jobs. A lot of drugs, a lot of violence, poor schools, broken homes, you know, the, the whole smear. And she was asked to build this park. She didn't take the job because she knew how to build a park. She'd never done that. She needed the $2,500 they were offering her. And she thought she would make it up if she went along. And she started to, I mean, she was faced with this space that had all this big concrete shards of the building that had collapsed. And she's dragging them away. And people were coming out coming around looking at her and thinking, you know, who is this tiny little Chinese woman and what she's doing here? But some kids offered to help her. 
And so they helped her clear the space. And in that moment, when they were helping her, she got an idea that changed her notion about art, changed her life, it changed the lives of those kids. She thought, you know, I'm here to do what a lot of artists do, which is, you know, build something uh, that, that comes from my imagination, and then I'm going to leave. And supposedly the people here are going to be happy with that. You know, that's what artists do, right? They come in and make a, you know, a monument, a sculpture, a mural or something, then they're gone. And she said, that's totally the wrong model. You know, first they ought to be doing something that is about their lives, and they ought to be participating in designing it. And she thought, you know, in this broken community, who still has the spark of life in it? Well, the kids. And so she talked to the kids and said, let's start drawing together. I want you to draw what you think should be in this space. And they drew all kinds of, you know, plants. They drew sculptures. They drew animals. They drew what could be mosaics on walls. And then she took them and refined them. And then she started to get into community members to help her build all this art. And it took years. But then it took more years, and they did something like 15 parks. They redesigned all the, uh, the living around the area. They built a, a, um, an auditorium. They built a place that instead of driving around to get away from it because you were afraid to stop there, you would go there. It was a destination to see how people had reinvented themselves through art. Economic development started in that community because of the way the people had reinvented themselves and what they, how they made their own community look. Um, I invite you all to go on the site of the Village of Arts and Humanities um, and look at what that community is like today. Really, after uh, maybe 20 years of doing that, she thought, you know, I want to be, and you know, now she, she started with $2,500. She now had a $1.5 million budget every year. Uh, and they were doing all these incredible things, and she thought, you know, I don't want to be an administrator. I want to be an artist. And she started this little group, a tiny group of people called Barefoot Artists, sort of like guerrilla artists who go to some of the most destitute places in the world and then use art to try to rescue a community, but basically teach the people that they can rescue themselves if they start with the imagination and vision and hope of their own children. I read about her, so I went to Philadelphia, met her, you know, painted her.